So um, I'll be talking about the fetal abdomen and the anterior abdominal wall. And I know we're running a little bit behind, so I will go rather quickly if I can. Um, so the University of Alberta acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respects um, histories, languages, cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. And I have no conflicts of interest or um, financial disclosures. So the purpose of my talk is to develop an approach to obtaining specific fetal abdominal images that, are, um, that uh, will optimize your pickup rate for what we're looking at. And of course, you know, if I had all day, we could talk about all the different fetal abdominal pathologic findings that, that uh, could be seen, but I will be focusing on just a few specific things that require um, very timely maternal fetal medicine um, uh, referral and the fo focus on the anterior abdominal wall. So things that I won't be covering, Dr. Abbasi covered this a little bit as well, the fetal diaphragm um, approach to the abnormal fetal genitalia and how to obtain fetal biometry, we just had that, and some normal anatomy. I'll just have a brief overview of the uh, normal anatomy. So first off, developing your standardized approach. Orient yourself first. What is the fetal presentation? What, is, what are the fetal left and right sides? Identification of your fetal abdominal borders. So starting with your keflat side, your diaphragm, and then your lateral um, edges, as well as the, the caudate portion with the pelvis. So we can see here um, on, with the image on the right side, the fetal diaphragm that's indicated by the arrow of the fetal liver just below that. Um, so uh, fetal head is on the left side of the image and then ca caudate is on the right. And then you can see the stomach as well as the bladder. So with your standardized approach, that anatomy list, and um, this is covered in the um, TOP uh, guidelines that were addressed earlier today, um, looking for the fetal stomach, the position, the presence, the situs, the bowel, kidneys, bladder, abdominal, umbilical arteries, cord insertion, so the umbilical cord insertion, and finally the interior abdominal wall. Some of the other list that we may look at, so not necessarily on the TOP uh, list, include the liver, renal arteries, adrenals, the spleen, the gallbladder, and the umbilical vein. So at this point, this is the last of the, of the thick of the content side of things. You're all experts on fetal anatomy. Hopefully this will not be too new to you. Um, if it is, that's great. Uh, I'll be covering fetal ascites and uh, reasons for that are um, this requires timely evaluation because of the whole wide differential of things that it could be. I'll be talking about some types of gastrointestinal tract obstruction um, uh, pathologies, as well as the anterior abdominal wall. So fetal ascites, we're looking for a hypochoic rim um, within the abdomen, specifically when you're looking around the liver. So this is a transverse view. Um, we're looking at the, the an attempt at an abdominal circumference. There is so much fluid that we can actually see the fetal liver and the falsiform ligament uh, in this image. Um, another clue to this is that the uh, skin is also thickened in this image. Now, we can also look at this through a sagittal view. With a sagittal view, you're looking at the area under the diaphragm. So that's one area to look at uh, uh, ascites, as well as the area around the liver. In the image here, we can see the heart labeled as H on the left side of the screen, the diaphragm that separates the liver, the little arrowheads that are indicating that hypochoic band around the liver and then the bowel as well. Um, the reason why timely assessment of fetal ascites is important because we need to find out the reason why this is happening, whether this is anemia, whether this is a non-immune high drops, is, is there a structural anomaly such as a cardiac anomaly that's causing this or infection? Um, there can also be genetic causes or metabolic causes of this as well. And the most important part of this is that some of these things can be treated or reversed, and that's why it requires timely investigation. In the image on the right side, we can see a significant amount of um, fetal cites, actually an outline of the fetal spine, the stomach, and the liver. Now, this is a, a picture of a fetus uh, with congenital syphilis. 
Uh, there's hepatomegaly, there's ascites in here as well. And you can see that um, with the hepatomegaly, just as a side tangent, we'll be talking about that. Um, that's also a key finding with the fetal ascites. So looking for those other abnormalities. So with fetal ascites uh, and hepatomegaly, how do we measure this? The key is to measure um, with the fetus right side up, and we're measuring from the right hemidiaphragm down to the tip of the liver lobe. And um, I do have a picture of that specific study that looked at what is the what are the normals, uh, normal lengths for uh, fetal liver. And it's important to know that when we're looking at that in the context of fetal, um, sorry, congenital syphilis or uh, fetal ascites. So this is a case through our clinic, looking at um, a set of monodi twins. Um, and we, could, we can see here that there was significant amount of ascites that's seen um, surrounding the bowel. So you can see this, this rim of, of fluid within the fetal abdomen. So this, is, this was twin to twin transfusion. I don't have any pictures of the, the amniotic fluid and, and uh, the other twin, but this was ultimately um, stage four twin to twin transfusion syndrome that had very timely um, transfer over to um, Mount Sinai for evaluation and treatment. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is um, pseudoascites. So this means, this is where we can sometimes overcall or, or get fooled by the fetal abdominal wall or the normal um, aspects of, of ultrasound. That's just the normal hypochoic layer um, along the fetal abdominal wall. And this is not true ascites. So at the same time of making sure that we're, we're calling ascites when we see it, um, also making sure that we're looking at several different angles um, of the fetus to, make, to ensure that we're not overcalling ascites as well. So just a brief overview in terms of the anatomy lesson of the gastrointestinal tract. Um, we have our stomach that leads down through to the pylorus, to the duodenum, um, and then into your, um, your jejunum and then your ileum and going, for, going forth from there. So the next portion is talking about uh, fetal stomach anomalies. And here's just a normal fetal stomach. There's no trick to this image. Um, normally placed stomach, normally situated, it's normal size. When we're thinking about fetal stomach abnormalities, specifically here um, in this picture on the right side, um, there's a very small um, fetal stomach that's seen. We want to identify the location. Is it on the left side or right side? So orienting yourself, the size of the stomach um, with the location, so situs identification, and then make sure that we're giving enough time to watch for filling and emptying. So consider up to uh, 30 minutes to visualize a normal stomach bubble. And the fetal stomach can be identified from about nine weeks onwards. Now, how do we do those measurements? Um, with KepKep's paper, they were looking at the normal size of the stomach measuring um, in a longitudinal position as well as transverse, and then also from an AP diameter standpoint. And this was their nomogram um, that they came up with uh, looking at what the normal size of the fetal stomach should be. Um, I found another, a little bit of a better uh, nomogram as well in terms of predicting what normal uh, stomach size should be uh, when thinking about if it's too small or too large. Now, um, when we're looking for an absent fetal stomach, besides the waiting for 30 minutes to make sure that it's filled, had the time to fill, we have to look for other clues as well. So perhaps there's oligohydramnios, there is, or anhydramnios, there's not enough fluid for that fetus to swallow. And then the other side of things is to look for polyhydramnio. So if we're if there could be um, some type of obstructive process where the fluid um, isn't being appropriately swallowed. Now, of those different um, entities, one of the things that we have to think about is esophageal atresia. So specifically, we're looking now at an absent stomach bubble. And so when we see an absent stomach bubble, the positive predictive value of um, esophageal atresia is unfortunately only about 62%. It's not great detection there. Um, sometimes there can be polyhydramnios depending on the situation with the tracheosophageal fistula. 
And then one of the other important signs to look for, so this kind of relates back to a case that Dr. Chandra had presented about polyhydramnios. Um, one of the things to look for, and it's not in the fetal abdomen, unfortunately, but it's in the fetal neck area or upper chest, is the upper pouch sign. And that's the picture that I have up on the right side with the fetal neck. Um, and you can see the uh, esophageal pouch or, or blind esophageal pouch that's dilated. And you can see that in up to about uh, 43%. Now, in terms of the differential diagnoses for absent fetal stomach, um, ruling out the fact that you've waited the appropriate time to allow for fetal stomach filling, um, we've got our soft yield tresias, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, um, uh, significant puff lip or pellet, um, movement disorders, uh, central nervous system anomalies or problems that prevent swallowing, bacterial, um, and again, oligohydramnios. Um, I want to present on some more rare things um, that are that can be seen. So gastric obstruction. So specific of this is pyloric atresia, where the end of the stomach is um, is not appropriately formed. And this is a very again very rare finding. Only about one percent of obstructions. Um, you can have a an isolated essentially well not isolated but only dilated stomach that can be identified within the fetal. Um, abdomen with polyhydramnios. And there's no second bubble, there's no dilated um, duodenum that's visualized. And that's what you can see here. Duodenal atresia. So I think most of you are probably more familiar with this one, um, the classic double bubble sign. And what we're looking for is a dilated stomach that tapers through um, to a small uh, to a small region uh, where the pylorus is expected to be. And then a second area of enlarged um, hypolucency. So that's your duodenum um, that you can see here. Um, so about a third of these roughly um, will be associated with aneuploidy, specifically trisomy 21. And so we're also looking for other signs or clues um, with soft markers um, on ultrasound. And then sometimes it can also present with polyhydramnios in that third trimester. So some more pictures of duodenal atresia. You've got your, on the left side, your classic double bubble sign. You've got your stomach and then your duodenum. And then sometimes you can see this C-shaped amount of fluid from the stomach trap traversing uh, down to the duodenum where, uh, where it's obstructed. And that can be uh, quite diagnostic uh, for detection rate of, uh, of duodenal atresia. Now, going further in the bowel, we have our duodenal and our ileal atresias. So as we go further and further down, it's more difficult um, to be certain about these diagnoses. So um, with duodenal atresia, uh, the pickup rate is about 66% prenatally. And then for ileal atresia, it's probably closer to 25%. Um, with duodenal atresia, sometimes we can have an enlarged stomach and multiple dilated loops of bowel, as well as um, polyhydramnios, but it's not, not always certain here. And then with duodenal and ileal atresia, uh, the risk of having a chromosomal abnormality is not high like duodenal atresia. It's probably around the 1% level. Um, here I have a picture, uh, uh, some images of ileotresia, so you can see multiple uh, other bowel loops dilated, not necessarily a dilated stomach that you can see. Um, you can be fooled by the fact that they almost look like haustra, so more large bowel, but um, with this case it was found to be an ileal obstruction. So your differential also includes some other things such as meconium ileus associated with cystic fibrosis, volvulus or Hirschsprung's disease or your aglionic uh, clonic issue. So um, moving on, I want to talk about the anterior abdominal wall. That's where there seems to be an opening where there shouldn't be. I just have this picture. I think most, uh, most uh, parents of toddlers will understand that this is the current form of entertainment in my household where I have uh, three, age three and under. Um, so abdominal wall defects, um, the ones that I'm going to be talking about, and it's not a comprehensive list by any means, are gastroschisis and phallocele. That's the, those are the more common um, entities that we see. Um, and then the rare ones with pentalogy of control, uh, bladder extrophy, and cloacal extrophy. Gastroschisis. So what we're looking for is a defect typically on the right side of the umbilical cord insertion. So we're scanning down to level of the umbilical cord insertion, and we can see free floating bowel loops um, outside. And um, sometimes um, 
that can be overcalled if it's a, if the diagnosis is made before 12 weeks, but typically best after 12 weeks because of the possibility of physiologic um, gut herniation. I do have some pictures of first trimester imaging as well. So when we're looking at fetal gastroschisis, we're looking again, scanning down to the level of um, the umbilical cord insertion. On the image on the left side, we can see the umbilical cord insertion that's on the, on the left, and the fetal right side is, is above that, um, and, the, and the abdominal wall defect just above. And you can see this cauliflower-like uh, free-floating bowel. Similarly, um, with the image on the right side, um, they've indicated where the cord insertion is. It's to one side with this um, uh, hyperechogenic lesion or abnormality uh, just adjacent to it that seems to be attached to the abdominal wall. So that would be your extruded um, bowel outside there. Um, this is uh, another case from our clinic as well. So looking at um, uh, extruded bowel outside of the fetal abdomen, um, you can see the umbilical cord vessels down the, along the left side and the defect on the right side. And then similarly, um, on the image on the right side uh, with the extruded bowel uh, in the abdominal circumference measurement. So in the first trimester, what are we looking for? It can be very tricky, um, but what we want you to do is, is put um, color Doppler on that possible abdominal wall defect and identify where the cord insertion is coming from. So is it from the top? Is it from the side? And so we can see that this is a one-sided, uh, um, uh, the cord insertion is along the one side and the this possible abdominal wall defect is on the other. And so more likely to be gastroschisis diagnosis in first trimester. So what are we looking for? We're trying to look for signs of complex gastroschisis when we're looking at how the, the bowel looks. Well, why is that? Um, complex gastroschisis uh, may, be, uh, may have implications for increased risk of preterm birth, neonatal death, um, short gut syndrome, parenteral nutrition dependence, and then hospitalization as well. So some things to look for, and I'll talk more about this as well, intra-abdominal bowel dilatation. So we're thinking, we're entertaining things like stenosis or atresia. Sometimes you can see very dilated bowel, and then in a follow-up scan, um, a deflated amount of bowel. So we're worried about perforation. We also ex would expect a smaller abdominal circumference because of the extruded bowel. So looking at gastroschisis, um, and this is taken out of a paper by Andrade um, et al. Uh, this is also, Nicolaides was also part of the study, um, looking at complex uh, gastroschisis. So they found that there was a higher incidence of complex gastroschisis, so atresia, stenosis, perforation, necrosis, and volvulus. If the intra-abdominal bowel dilatation at 20 to 22 weeks was over seven, seven, seven millimeters, sorry. Um, and then at 30 to 32 weeks, if it was found, uh, if it was equal to or greater than 14 millimeters. Now, moving on to emphalocele, uh, this is a midline abdominal uh, wall defect where you still have your peritoneal sac around that area and the umbilical cord um, essentially comes out at the um, tip of that or at the end of that sac. Up to 80% can be associated with, with either structural or genetic uh, anomalies. So in, in general, we do expect there to be some other signs. Now, when we're looking at an seal, you need to first scan down to level of the umbilical cord and look at where is that umbilical cord coming from. With the image on the left side, um, you can see the umbilical cord is indicated by the arrow, and then the arrow heads are just indicating the, um, the significant abdominal wall defect. And then on the right side, it's a sagittal view of the same, um, looking at the significantly uh, herniated um, uh, fetal liver. Now, again, we, it's very important to, to identify the externalized um, lesion or externalized uh, abdominal contents at the level of the cord insertion. You can see the cord insertion coming around um, just at the tip of that, and it's being measured there. And again, you can look at it in several different ways. So you can look at it with a sort of sagittal view of the cord insertion and, as well as transverse to identify exactly what is coming out. 
With emphalocele's in that first trimester, you can see a uniform um, protrusion. Um, ideally, you have co uh, color on it as well to identify um, where the core insertion is going into. And again, a diagnosis after 12 weeks is ideal because of the physiologic gut herniation ruling out anything um, at that point. It can also be very difficult to see in the first trimester, depending on maternal body habitus. Classification. So there's um, there are a couple of different ways in terms of location for classification, but ultimately we want to know um, is it epigastric, so above the umbilicus, is it umbilical, is it hypogastric, and the size of the defect matters as well. So is it uh, considered a small or giant? And then depending on how far along um, you are, the um, as long as we can see over 50%, so say it's earlier in gestation, um, if it's over 50% of the cross section of the fetal torso, then we do we do expect that to be a giant um, of palisile. And then whether, whether it's ruptured is also important. So I have a picture here of an unruptured emphalocele um, in this, uh, uh, from this paper, uh, where you can see the, this um, amniperitoneal sac that's wrapping around. You can see it almost looks like a membrane at that point in time uh, with some herniated liver. And, this, and then um, here you can see the, the unruptured and then the sac rupture. Um, uh, um, phallocele. So there was a significant amount of ascites. You can see outline of liver. And then several weeks later, they scanned and that was gone. Sometimes can also be tricky um, in the rare case of a phallocele rupture, um, looking at um, uh, if there's bowel protruding, whether or not that's gastroschisis, but it also depends on the location of the abdominal wall defect. So it's important to take a look at that as well um, to give you clues as to what, what was the originating uh, problem. Now, again, you're looking for uh, signs of uh, liver herniation and, and what are the organs that are on the outside. So in this image here, um, you can see the fetal diaphragm um, and you can see the fetal liver and part of that liver tip, just at that edge coming out and then primarily um, bowel contents inside, um, uh, inside the herniated area. It's important to follow those umbilical vessels as well. You can see that the cord insertion is inserting at the tip or at the top edge of the seal coming in. And then here is an image where uh, it's a large seal, primarily of the liver. You can also put color to take a look at that seal um, and understand what's, what are the contents of that seal. And that can be helpful for, uh, from a surgical uh, standpoint to understand what they might be if, it, if there ends up being a problem um, uh, and requiring surgery, that might be helpful as well. But again, it's more for prognostication. So pentalogy of control. If someone knows uh, of a uh, cartoon of it, that would be great. I could not find one that was a nice cartoon picture or diagram of pentalogy. Um, so this is the best I could find. Um, so in terms of pathology of Cantrell, we're looking at five specific things. So we're looking at a midline supraumbilical abdominal wall defect, a defect in the lower sternum, um, and a defect in the anterior diaphragm, and then a cardiac anomaly as well. In the picture on the right side that you can see, uh, there is an seal that's in the lower portion here, and then this is an extruded uh, heart outside the fetal uh, chest with those. So that's a lower sternal uh, defect that we can see. Now, um, other things that we're looking for, uh, again, we're looking for um, the external, slightly externalized heart. Um, you can see um, in this one, there's an seal with the abdominal uh, contents that are outside the fetal abdomen and that lower sternal cleft and part of the heart that's also um, seen um, outside of fetal chest. Now, in terms of the classification, you don't need all five of these to say that this is a pentalogy. Um, you can have uh, different classifications of it. So class one is the definite diagnosis. They have all five. Um, class two, so most probable, um, that's where you still have, you have four out of the five, but certainly the ventral wall um, uh, uh, defect as well as the cardiac anomaly. And you can still have incomplete expression of pentalogy. When we're looking at um, uh, 
pentalogy again, you want to have a good transverse view to understand where, what is coming out and how much of it is coming out. So this image is very good to look at um, the, the field core insertion, the impella seal, and then just superior and trailing that is the uh, fetal heart that's also coming out uh, with um, that tissue. So you can you anticipate that there is a sternal, um, clostrum opening as well. Now, can we diagnose this in first trimester? The answer is yes. So if you see a fetus with a possible impella seal, and well, I'll have more on that, um, and the heart is seen um, more anterior than expected, or looks like it's entering into um, that um, that uh, anterior ventral wall defect, then you're concerned about possible pentalogy. Now, the most commonly recognized sign um, is actually the is actually a, an impella seal 90% of the time. Um, and I have pictures here of um, a 2D image as well as a 3D image of um, a fetus with pentalogy of control. And the first most recognizable sign is that impella seal. The second most recognized sign is that the impella seal seems to um, extend anteriorly more than expected. So that, um, that sternal clefting. And the least recognizable one, um, so unless it's it's right out there, um, is actually ectopia cordis, which is where the heart is outside. Um, so in the first trimester, it can also be associated with increased nuchal translucency. So when we see that um, emphalocele, although emphalocele itself may also have increased nuchal translucency, um, just recognizing that there are other um, uh, abnormalities that you may see. So bladder extrophy. Um, so I have it in a male and a female, just in the cartoon version, just to, to be to make it easier to understand. But essentially, imagine your bladder is open to the outside world, um, and that's basically the gist of what you're looking for. So we are looking for a lower or ventral abdominal wall defect uh, resulting in an averted bladder so that uh, your bladder is essentially open to the amniotic fluid around it. Your first, the first thing that you should notice is that you can't find the bladder. So looking with your um, umbilical, uh, sorry, with your umbilical artery view, um, you, can't, you cannot identify a full bladder. However, the fluid is still normal. And we see that on the right side in the bladder area with the uh, umbilical vessels and uh, no bladder can be identified. Going beyond the absent bladder, you notice that there's an, a lower abdominal bulge that's formed by an extra feed bladder. So um, you might see this irregularly shaped or small bulge that's, that can be very subtle um, seen in lower abdominal uh, wall. And then if it's a male, you can see a, um, a small penis or anteriorly displaced and abnormal genitalia. And then you can also have a low core insertion. Um, again, this is another picture here um, on the right side that shows a low cord insertion and this abnormal um, anterior abdominal wall mass that was identified, and that's the extra feed, um, part of the extra feed bladder. Um, so we're looking again uh, with these two images, um, the umbilical cord inserting superior to this lower abdominal wall mass, and what that is, is it's um, an everted uh, bladder plate. Um, although I said I wouldn't talk in detail about ambiguous genitalia, sometimes you can see this ambiguous genitalia presenting with that superior mass. And that's what we're seeing here on the right side. Um, the arrows are pointing to this ambiguous genitalia with that, um, with a superior uh, mass. Cloacal extrophy. So, um, couple images here that are important. Um, on the left side, just to show what we're looking at, this is a this would be a female uh, cloacal malformation. Um, you would have a uterus, um, you would have a bladder and a colon all emptying into the same um, into the same tract. So that's your cloaca. And what it may look like if there is also extrophy is that um, this would all be everted out. And so we're, we can see an phallocele in the superior portion. Um, the bladder, which has everted out, um, uh, is externalized essentially. And you can have it split in two. So you've got a hemi bladder on both sides. And then the bowel is also extruding out. So we're, we've got everything kind of everted and out uh, with a common track essentially. 
And so when we see this, um, and specifically the hemibladder and the bowel, um, it looks like an elephant trunk, essentially. And that is a specific sign that we're going to look for in the ultrasound as well. So with clavicle estrophy, it can be quite difficult to diagnose. Sometimes it presents as a pelvic, a central pelvic mass. Um, got five minute countdown um, and ambiguous genitalia. And the other clues are um, urologic abnormalities that can be found in 90%. Um, with the uh, insertion of the umbilical cord, uh, we're looking for the insertion of the umbilical cord just superior to this, um, uh, to this abnormality. I'll just quickly go through because I want to show you the key pictures. So you can have prolapse of the cecum between the hemi bladders that results in an elephant trunk um, presentation. Um, and that's what the, the arrow is pointing to. And I have a better one next here with the bladder plates that are seen and a bowel loop extruding. Uh, again, there are other abnormalities that can be seen with cloacal extrophy, and so um, OE, OEIS can also be associated with that. So that's your um, enthalpial extrophy, imperfect uh, anus, and uh, spinal abnormalities. And just to tell you that there is, I have a big chart that you can definitely look at and come back to in terms of different uh, differential diagnoses uh, for abdominal wall defects there. So in summary, remember ascites is important. There's a Y differential. Please refer if you see it. Um, GI uh, tract obstructive processes. Um, think about what's missing, what's too big, what's too small, your abdominal, or sorry, your amniotic fluid volume. Abdominal wall defects, location is important, size, what's inside and what's missing. And then if you have any questions, call your friendly neighborhood regional, wherever you are, MFM. If you see something that doesn't quite look right, I do not have rights to any of these images. Thank you very much. Hi, Cheryl, that's so great. Um, so much wonderful material. I wish we had more time, um, but we have a couple questions. Um, the uh, the first one is, uh, I think it's, is actually an interesting one. Um, what, do you, what do you do from a, a sonographer perspective um, to show like ultrasound pictures of the baby when major abnormalities have been detected? I think that one's a tough one. So, you know, I, I, I'm in a diff, little bit of a different role because my job is to tell the patient what I see. Um, but for the sonographers, I think that it's it depends a little bit on the clinic policy as well. I think that some clinics are more open to it. Um, the sonographer can talk about you know what they're seeing throughout. Um, I leave it up to their discretion. I think it's really case by case. So if this if these are parents that know that there's already a problem and they want to specifically look at it, so they've already been primed, that's one thing. But um, I think that for a lot of parents, they don't know what's happening, and and I, I'm not sure that that's the best place to to tell them just yet. So perhaps after discussion with the or either radiologists or MFM first might be helpful. Okay, excellent. Um, and um, in the first trimester, is there any objective measurements that you can do uh, to help differentiate if it's an emphalocele or a physiologic gut herniation? There can be, and I had looked at it before. I didn't present anything like that, but um, I think part of it would be having uh, reassessing it. So looking at what gestational age are you, how much is extruded is also important. Um, putting color on it, so looking at where the core insertion is. Um, uh, but ultimately, I think the important part is, is looking at gestational age and how much is out at that point in time. Definitely by 12 weeks, it should be all inside. So if you see yeah. something, that's there's something wrong. Yeah, we were saying earlier that it should be by 12 weeks, but there could be rare sort of situations. And I, I think I, I certainly have had a case and I know um, uh, somebody else has that as well. So definitely at 12 weeks, it's not normal. So you have to bring them back within a week um, to relook by th look at 13 weeks, so for sure. And then um, there, there may be some other questions in the chat if you're able to answer, but I know we are running a little tight. So um, are sagittal images required in the diagnosis of emphalocele? I see uh, lots of examples of transverse only. What's the role of sagittal images? Um, I think I did have a sagittal one as well. So I think that it's important because I find it a little bit easier to see where the liver is. Um, so when I when you line it all up, you've got your diaphragm, your liver, and you can follow that as well if you use color to see how much of the liver is also um, in that emphalocele. So I do like the sagittal images for that reason. And then if you can line it up with the cord insertion too. Absolutely. 
Great, perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm sure your life as a, an MFM specialist and mom of three kids under the age of three, that makes me so tired. Um, <laughs> we really appreciate you joining us today. Great, Absolutely. and I hope you can stick around for the to answer some of those extra questions and to listen to our next part, which is cases. <laughs> <laughs>